Ooh, recording in progress. Excellent. Uh, I'm going to click got it rather than leave meeting because that would be rather disappointing otherwise. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it always feels a bit weird giving a talk, staring at a computer screen with no one else in the room, but I know you're all there and I'm really looking forward to sharing my passion for drones with you all. So um, I'll just give you a quick rundown of what the second half of the talk will be about. As um, Anne mentioned, the first half will be a show and tell of drones that I've got here, because normally when I give these talks to camera clubs, I'll actually go out and give a demo flight of the different drones uh, outside, but can't do that here. I won't do it here in the office. Uh, so the second half um, will cover off, um, just introduce in more detail who I am, what my background is. We'll talk about what a drone is, how they evolved, what they can do, uh, what's the state of the art, and then the interesting things about can anyone buy one, what are the regulations, and for those of you interested in using them commercially, what steps you have to go through, and obviously because it's the photographic, Royal Photographic Society, I have to show you some pictures as well, which is really all it's, it's what it's all about. Um, but yes, so the first, shot, first half is a show and tell, so I will stop my screen sharing, which I assume will mean I go full screen for you guys. If not, make sure I'm filling your screen so you can see um, see me in full, full screen, full size. Um, so yeah, I thought in place of giving a demo flight, I'll give you a show and tell. So I thought I'd start with the biggest drone that I've got, which is this one. And I'll go into it in more detail in, in the second half about drones and how they've evolved. But what you'll notice, uh, you probably already noticed, is that drones tend to look quite similar. They, these days at least, they all have obviously a payload, which is a camera of some sort or a sensor. They have propellers that lift it off the ground. Generally, most commonly they have four. Uh, some bigger ones have six or sometimes eight, often arranged in a circle, but often uh, sometimes they're actually doubled up. So you'll have four pairs on top of each other. And really the minimum you need, technically, I suppose is two. Um, three is a bit better, but a bit awkward in terms of how you actually um, control the movement of the drone with three. Four is really, that's why it's, it's become the most common setup, is an ideal balance of you know, complexity versus maneuverability. Um, so all the drones I'll be showing you here have four propellers and they all have different payloads. And that's really what determines why you need drones of different sizes. So obviously a bigger drone can carry a bigger camera, which will understandably be better quality. Uh, and so this is the biggest one that I've got. Uh, it's by no means the biggest you can get. The biggest wouldn't fit in this room, quite literally. Uh, so this is called the DJI Inspire 2. And I've got three DJI drones here. Uh, I'm not affiliated with them. They just make amazing equipment <laughs> and uh, they're just workhorses. They never, never really go wrong. Um, this one has been around, I think, since 2015 now. I can't quite believe it. It's it's the, the go to readily available, uh, re solidly reliable, dependable drone for TV and film work. Let me just point that down a bit. And the reason is, is that it carries an incredibly good camera. So this is the current top of the line uh, camera for the for this drone and for any of their drones, actually. It's called the X7, and it's basically a mirrorless camera in a stabilized gimbal, and it has interchangeable lenses. And the sensor size is about a 1.5 times crop. So it's not full frame. It's yeah, 1.5 crop, which is also known as APS-C. Um, they do have a full frame version of this. They don't have a drone that can carry it. No, that's not true. They do have a drone that can carry it. Um, but I think there's an Inspire 3 coming, which will be built around the, the new full frame camera. Um, 
And so this has a resolution of 24 megapixels. It is all of the DJI cameras are completely controllable remotely from the controller. So um, I've not got the controller for this with me, but they all have much the same functionality. Um, let me just grab this one. They often look like this. Uh, so this one has a screen built into the controller um, and the other features you have are the two control sticks, a couple of buttons on the top and some control wheels on the back for adjusting things like the camera angle, triggering the photo, taking the uh, starting the video recording, and then obviously the two control sticks are what actually move, move the drone around the sky. Um, but going back to the camera, uh, so this can take 24 megapixel raw photos, or it can take up to 5.2K video um, at, I think 5.2K is 30 frames a second, or 4K at 60 frames a second, something around, around that sort of spec. Um, and what makes this quite unique is that, should you wish to, in the back, um, there's a slot for a solid state hard drive because when you're filming at incredibly high data rates, which you need for TV and film work, so that you don't have pixely blotchy footage, uh, you need a lot of storage space that's very, very fast um, read-write speed. So I think you can get this in 240, 480, and six, 600 gigabytes uh, in these removable drives. And they'll probably only last you an hour or two, depending on what quality film uh, video that you're recording. Uh, so yeah, this is really the main the mainstay for a lot of TV and film photographers. Um, what else makes it unique? You, you'll see that the arms are currently in a sort of inverted V formation. When you turn this on and power it up, and it takes off, this actually the arms actually move up. And the idea is that then the only thing hanging beneath the drone is the camera, and that means it can rotate 360 degrees um, without obstruction. Um, it does have an end stop, it can't go continuously, so it hits an end stop there. But basically, if you're following something, uh, you can have a separate pilot operating the drone and someone else purely looking at a video feed and controlling the camera. And so that makes a very powerful filming setup because there's only so much that one can handle uh, yourself if you're trying to fl fly the drone around in space and follow something on the ground. It makes it quite difficult. So yeah, the the, the camera gimbal uh, can be rotated in 360 degrees. Uh, it has roll stabilization as well. So no matter what the drone does, no matter how it moves through the sky, uh, it's it will remain perfectly locked level. Um, this is something I go into a bit more detail in the second half as to how this, this technology originated. And really, without the stabilised camera, drones didn't get very far. As soon as this came along and the, the technology is really honed, this is where this is when drones really uh, took off uh, and their potential became realised. Um, oh yeah, and it can also pan vertically down. 90 degrees well actually beyond 90 degrees down so yeah and it has two batteries this particular one um for two reasons well three reasons i suppose one is redundancy so um if one of the batteries were to fail or became somehow disconnected the other the second battery would still have enough power to allow you to fly uh, to land safely it wouldn't just fall out of the sky um most drones just have one battery but because this is designed for sort of professional use in congested environments uh, where there are going to be probably a lot of people, actors or whatever, having redundancy is very useful. Also, there's a limit as to the size of bat um, the capacity of batteries you can take on board aircraft. Um, and this is basically maximizes uh, the, yeah, if I take one out. So that is the largest lithium battery you can take on board an aircraft. Uh, you can take several of them, but each battery can cannot be any larger than that uh, in terms of its capacity. Um, and also having two batteries means you get nearly twice as much flight time as if you had one, albeit you're carrying more weight. So it's not exactly 
you double the number of batteries, you double the flight time because you're carrying more weight as well. Um, so yeah, that's the that's the Inspire 2. Um, it's got a number of sensors on it that help you to avoid obstacles. As I was saying before the talk started, the manufacturers are adding more and more sensors to drones with each iteration to try and basically make it more, I'm going to call it idiot proof, uh, make it more and more hard to crash. So this has got two sensors that look forward uh, and it can detect things up to, I think, five or six meters away. So if you're flying towards something and it suddenly sees an obstacle, it will automatically bring the, the drone to a, to a halt. Uh, it's got sensors above for the same purpose. So if you're flying uh, with obstacles overhead, it's got sensors to detect those. And it's got sensors on the bottom for detecting the ground or uh, obstacles that are underneath you. Um, this particular one doesn't have sensors behind. So if the drone is flying backwards, uh, it's you can fly it into things without, <laughs> without it trying to stop you. Um, but again, modern drones, um, because this I bought this in 2018, I think, um, modern drones have even more sensors that are even more capable. Um, partly because the, what really, uh, put this down now, it's quite heavy. Uh, what's really the, the area of evolution and improvement with drones these days is the their autonomous capabilities so how they can do things automatically uh you so you can program them to fly preset routes to to fly the same route over and over again which is useful for capturing footage of say a construction site that's evolving over time and so if you're or the, the thing they really push is you know when you're doing all your adventurous outdoor activities like mountain biking and skiing and and whatever um, the idea is, you can set the drone to follow you, and just you know, you don't need to think about it anymore. It'll just keep a set distance from you, and obviously, it then needs the sensors to avoid hitting things because you're concentrating on skiing downhill rather than actually flying the drone. Um, and so that that ability to not sort of think for itself, but fly autonomously and avoid things, is really where. Uh, drone uh, drones are advancing each year because okay battery technology is slowly increasing um so the the flight times are slowly going up still cameras cameras are always improving and they always will do so um th those are the really the main things that are improving with each uh, iteration um so unless anyone has any questions i'll i'll start moving down the scale oh this is lighter <laughs> It's a lot easier to hold. Um, so this is the, the next smallest one I've got. It's called the DJI Mavic 2 Pro. And this I've had for a number of years. The main reason I got it is to take on holiday, I'll be honest, uh, mainly because, and this is where my background as an engineer um, I, doesn't, it doesn't come in, but it makes me appreciate how much thought goes into a product like this. Uh, it, this is designed to completely fold up and the, the propellers fold up, the arms fold in, and then the whole thing can go into a very small shoulder bag. And that's, yeah, to me, that's that's a fantastic bit of engineering. And it's got the same, it's got all the same sort of components that the larger drone has. It's, they're just on a on a smaller scale. So um, the battery is the, the main main weight, the main bulk of the, the drone. It only has the one battery and that sits in an, on top. And then at the front, you can see it has the, the camera in a, in a gimbal. This doesn't have interchangeable lenses. It's too small to be able to, to offer that. Um, and so this is a 20 megapixel camera, can do uh, yeah, shoots in RAW and can also do video at 4K up to I think 30 frames a second. The newer ones can do much higher frame rates and higher uh, resolutions as well. Um, but yeah, it's, as I mentioned earlier, it's uh, the, the whole concept of drones is very scalable. So if you, um, th the idea of this is to make it more uh, portable, to make it more uh, lightweight. And so you obviously can't carry the same camera as the, the bigger drone. But uh, this, 
was actually the first DJI drone that had a camera that was um, built or designed in partnership with Hasselblad. You can see on the front there. I think DJI now own quite a large stake in Hasselblad, which was quite a clever move by them because the, a drone is only as good as the camera that's that it's carrying. And to be to be fair to them, their image quality has been is is really very very good. Um, and it's, it's probably a combination of that and just the general user interface, the the design, the the reliability that has kept DJI out in front of all their competitors because there are a number of other companies that make drones, um, such as um, Parrot, uh, Anafi, uh, GoPro tried and, and failed. Uh, there aren't really many others. And so I think uh, one of the things that keeps DJI ahead is their image quality. So um, the, the next drone I'm gonna show you is, is an even smaller one. And there's a similar version available from a different manufacturer, but the, the, the DJI version was, was just leagues ahead in terms of its image quality. Um, so again, this has uh, multiple sensors on the front. Uh, this one has some on the back as well. You can see the little black, black dots there, has them on the top, has them on the bottom. Uh, so this is more difficult to crash than the other one. Or you can turn the, the obstacle avoidance sensors off, uh, which I actually do because they can sometimes be a little bit over cautious. So if you're trying to land in a confined area with tree branches and things around, it might actually just stop you from landing, which is not very helpful. Uh, so this is about, oh, and to give you an idea of costs, the, the big drone, it, it does vary depending on how on what camera what option you choose and obviously how many batteries and controllers you buy but i think the inspire 2 with that camera and all the batteries that i've got is probably about six or seven thousand pounds quite expensive but it's a tool of the trade and it helps me to earn my living so um it pays for itself this one was about a thousand pounds um like most of DJI's drones are, their, their pro line of drones are around a thousand pounds. But again, for the the reliability, the image quality, the uh, the design, it's for me that's very good value. Um, so yeah, that's the Mavic Two Pro. Now moving down to the uh, a very interesting category of drones is the sub two hundred and fifty gram section. The, to give you a comparison, the Inspire 2 is about four kilograms. The Mavic 2 is about 900 grams. 250 grams is a regulatory um, weight category that was introduced probably two or three or four years ago. And it's an internationally recognized weight category where it's generally understood that if a drone of 250 grams or less were to hit you or fall out of the sky, it's probably not going to kill you. Uh, I don't know if that's the that's the the main uh, defining factor of what makes it safe is if it can kill you or not. Um, but basically, I think across the world, I don't know in great details of what the regulations are in other countries, but certainly in the UK, if a drone is 250 grams or below, the, re the regulations are relaxed quite significantly. Um, the regulations, which I'll go into later, are all about reducing risk to both the pilot, um, other members of public who are not involved with the, the drone work, um, whether they're walking around in cars, in other aircraft, and so on. Uh, so as soon as you go below 250 grams, you can overfly uninvolved people that's the key phrase um overfly means you can obviously fly over their heads uninvolved are people that have no idea that your drone is there um otherwise so as soon as you go above this weight if you want to overfly people you really need to let them know you need to involve them in the work so it's fine if you're on a film set or you're on a construction site where it's easy to manage the um the, the 
the crowd of people. You can tell them in advance that a drone will be operating to be constantly aware of it. And they also need to be ideally within, well, I think they have to be within earshot of the, the drone operator so that if something were to happen, you can you can get their attention and make sure that they're aware that something might have gone wrong with the drone and to look up and avoid it. Um, but it's assumed that this 250 gram category has revolutionized, certainly for me, how I can use drones because um, it's, it allows me to put a drone like this into almost any, use it in almost any location that I need to. And there are still restrictions that are blanket restrictions, regardless of the size or weight of the drone, which includes uh, not flying near, obviously, airports or other sensitive sites such as prisons or Buckingham Palace, the, the usual things that you'd hope people's common sense would prevent them from flying too close to. Um, but it's this, uh, the uninvolved people element, which uh, has, is what for me makes this category of drone invaluable. And in fact, since they introduced that category, um, oh, I've just realized I've got a second one of these in the cupboard, um, which is a, a slightly older version. Could have got that one out as well. Um, yeah, it's, it's just revolutionized how I use drones. And I'd say I now use this 95% of the time compared to the big Inspire, even though the Inspire 2 has a better camera, this camera is still very good considering its size. So if you think about how smartphone cameras have evolved over the years and how really they're, they're very good for their size these days, this is kind of the same. So this is a 12 megapixel camera, but it's sort of also a 48 megapixel camera. Uh, I won't go into the technical details because even I don't quite understand how it works, but basically it's got four times as many pixels, but they're not treated in as individual pixels in, in the image that you take. So basically it can do some clever interpolation and get you more information and detail than a normal 12 megapixel photo, but it's not the same as having a 48 megapixel camera on board. Um, it does allow it to do clever things like, um, because each collection of four pixels, um, it can have two of them operating at one shutter speed and the other two operating at, at a different shutter speed, which is mind blowing. And basically it means it can take two exposures at the same time, which means for video, you can get really amazing uh, high dynamic range um, footage because you're effectively taking two images for every frame at the same time. And to have that kind of capability in a drone of this size uh, is, is remarkable. So as soon as this came out, I bought it immediately and I've used it nonstop ever since more or less. Um, and yeah, the technology is only going to continue to improve. Uh, so I'm sure the, the cameras will get even better as the years go on. Um, this is already a, a remarkable little thing. It can fly for half an hour, depending on how fast you're flying. Uh, it again, it's completely fold up, so the um, the arms all fold in, and it goes into a ridiculously tiny little package. Um, and yeah, it's I, I use it very very frequently. Um, and again, yeah, exactly the same concept of the, the stabilized gimbal. So it's it's got uh, pan, uh, sorry, tilt. It's got pan left and right. And it's also got, so small, I can't even hold it, um, a little bit of roll stabilization as well. Uh, obviously there are limits as to the sort of conditions you can fly these in, particularly with wind, but you can generally fly, my rule of thumb is, is no, with, with gusts that are no more than 30 miles an hour, which is quite a lot. It's quite a stiff wind. Um, and really, if you fly in winds above that, it'll, you, you'll find you won't be able to bring it back to land. It'll just get slowly blown further and further away from you. Um, so that's the, the, it's called the Mini 3 Pro by DJI. And yeah, it's really the state of the art and it is a remarkable little thing. Um, any questions so far? It doesn't look like it. Um, now I want to talk about a slightly different category 
and in many ways this um we've come full circle when dji introduced their first drone around 2011 i think it was called the phantom phantom one and it became the ubiquitous um drone because it was the the, the first really mass produced commonly available platform that you could buy and it was very distinctive it's all white it had a sort of u-shaped fixed undercarriage but the first camera at the first phantom you had to provide your own gopro camera which you literally stuck onto it with self-adhesive and wherever the drone moved the camera moved with it so you can imagine how nauseating the footage that it shot would be to look back i mean it was it was very cool at the time you can it allowed people to to fly drones that uh wouldn't have normally been able to fly model aircraft in the past because inherently model helicopters are very difficult to fly because they don't have any kind of automatic stabilization um and the the phantom one was i think the first drone that introduced gps position hold so you know you could let go of the controls and it would just sit there in a hover but really the image quality wasn't usable on a professional level uh so i think it took i think the phantom 2 had dji's own um designed uh, gimbal and it was okay it was certainly better than not having a gimbal but the the image quality was still pretty poor um it certainly it was no match for the sort of quality of footage and, and uh, images that you could take from ground level so I was already keeping an eye on that sort of development but it, it didn't interest me uh, and then it then evolved through multiple iterations the, the cameras became really good the gimbals became really good but the reason I mention all this is that now um, you might have heard of a, a, a category of drone called FPV drones which stands for first person view and look what's made a comeback that's a gopro <laughs> albeit it's the gopro in this case the gopro 11 stripped down to its bare basics um so all the the the, the bulky frame the battery's been been taken off and fpv stands for first person view so um actually let me just go and get my fpv goggles so it uh, makes sense what i'm talking about so yeah fpv means first person view which as the name implies means you fly the drone as if you're sitting in it not literally <laughs> but normally you'd fly a drone by you stand on the ground you look up at it and you maneuver it around the sky based on what you can see that it's doing um you do have a video link that allows you to see what the camera is seeing and that's been included from drones since the very beginning almost otherwise you'd be shooting blind and you'd have no idea what you're really taking pictures of until you land um but the whole concept of fpv flying is that you wear a set of goggles like this and what you see inside the the lenses is basically like you're sitting in a cinema and you can just see a big rectangular screen in front of you and the reason for that is that you're you're then effectively the pilot so imagine if you're sitting in a drone and you're just looking ahead of you you can fly a drone quite easily uh and in some senses more easily than flying it standing on on the ground looking up seeing it flying around because um when you're flying a drone looking up at it if it's coming towards you that the controls can feel like they're reversed because if you push the stick to the right uh it'll appear to roll to the left so it can be a little bit confusing until you get used to it whereas when you're flying it through goggles it's as if you're sitting in the pilot seat and if you press the, the stick to the right it's going to roll to the right and so this has again this is um these drones have evolved not not over many years maybe two or three years and again it's a combination of how quickly camera technology has has improved to be light enough to put on a drone of this size so um this isn't a, a sub 250 gram drone although if you take the gopro off and just use 
this little camera in the front here, then it will be below 250 grams. Um, but what this drone allows me to do is I can fly it in places that I couldn't and wouldn't want to risk flying a big drone, particularly in, in tight environments where um, that's the other disadvantage of flying a drone in the normal sense, is that as soon as it gets beyond a certain distance from you, it, get, it becomes really difficult to judge um, firstly how far away it is from you, whether the tree that you are that you see behind it is that really close to you or is it still very distant, and certainly you really don't want to go behind any object from your perspective because you've got no idea how close you are to it. Whereas if you imagine you're seeing exactly what the, the camera on the drone is seeing, you can suddenly drive it, it's quite a good term actually, you can drive it around the sky as if you're the pilot. And so this allows me to take really dynamic and engaging footage that make people think, whoa, how was that shot? And some of you may have seen the um, some of these videos have gone viral on the internet. There's one amazing one of a, a bowling alley in the US, I think, and it basically flies in through the entrance. Um, it flies through along one of the bowling lanes up underneath where the skittles are and then through all of the complicated machinery and then it pops out in some other room and then it flies through the cafe and it's all one continuous shot and obviously you can do that if you're flying first person because you're seeing exactly what the drone is seeing the whole time um there's no way you could do that in, with it in any other way so this i've only had for the last not even a year actually um well, I've got two of them because <laughs> it's always worth having a backup. So I got this one in about July, June last year. Uh, this has a GoPro 10 on it, uh, stripped down to its bare basics. This is the GoPro 11. And even that uh, small incremental uh, increment in um, its, its feature set, this has 10-bit video recording, which means you get um, more scope for doing color grading in the in the post-production um this also has a most digital slr cameras have a three by two aspect ratio sensor um gopros usually or used to have i think it's, it's four by three which is quite square the gopro 11 has an eight by seven sensor which is almost square and so what that allows you to do um is and that's sorry i should have mentioned that earlier what has allowed GoPros to be used in this application is the advancement in image stabilizing. And so both uh, software that you use on the computer, which can stabilize video footage, but what makes the, the GoPros unique now is that they actually record and embed into the video file how the camera is moving. And so that information can then be used by the stabilizing software to create an incredibly stable image, even though the drone's doing this, and obviously this is hard mounted to the drone. And so if you look at the raw video file, it looks, you know, horrible. Um, and yet you press the magic button on the computer and it's suddenly as stable as footage from a, a drone that has a, a mechanically stabilized camera. Um, and I've lost my train of thought now. <laughs> oh yeah, the eight by eight by seven sensor. So what that means is that um, because the image is stabilized by basically taking a crop out of the middle of the image frame, with the older sensors, you can you could crop about, I think it's up to 45 degrees out of the, the image frame and still have decent enough resolution for, for the video. But with this size sensor, it can basically you can do this and the footage can be stabilized so that it the, the horizon stays level. So again, this is just another iteration on uh, on how the the cameras for drones has been improving year in year out. The disadvantage of this type of drone is that it can only fly for about three to six minutes, um, which actually, to be fair, is a lot is long enough because after three to six minutes of flying this with the goggles on, my hands are shaking because it's quite concentrated so um i'm glad to be able to land it after that time um but yeah this is just yet another exciting 
new tool that will allow me to offer different types of footage to my clients. And in the second half, I'll show you a couple of examples hot off the press uh, of what I've managed to achieve with this. Um, so that is FPV drones. And then lastly, for a bit of fun, this is also a drone. Uh, and again, it just goes to show that the the whole concept of drones is completely scalable. So it has four propellers. They work in exactly the same way as a big drone. Uh, it does have a camera. It's a really terrible camera. It's about 640 by 480 pixels, and it connects to your phone. Um, but it's it's such a little blast to fly. Uh, it flies for about three minutes. And normally when I give this as a camera club talk, I would fly around the audience um, with this little thing sounding like a demented mosquito. Uh, but yeah, it just goes to show that the concept is completely scalable. Obviously, I don't use this for any kind of professional application, but it is a lot of fun. So that was a lot of talking. Um, I can see there's a thing in the chat here. Can you use goggles with the Mini 3 Pro? Hmm, a good question. This is a good question, actually. I, I don't think you can. I could be wrong, though. Um, yeah, I'd need to look into that. Uh, yeah, good first question. It's already flummoxed me, so well done. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, that's really what I wanted to go through with the show and tell. Has anyone have any questions? Ah, do you use filters? Um, by that, I assume you mean things like uh, circular polarizing filters or neutral density filters? A neutral density. Uh, yes, I do. Um, so most, if not all, of these drones, um, you can either screw on a, a filter using a thread, or they are designed to clip on. So on the Mini 3 Pro here, you see that little plastic rectangle on the front. Um, it's just a a twist bayonet fitting and then it comes off and then I have a range of filters actually I can show them to you which you can attach to the front like this um and so this one oh no this one is a circular circular polarizer which me which makes the sky look more blue and removes reflections from leaves and other reflective surfaces but the rest of them are neutral density filters, which are basically dark pieces of glass. And they are useful for when, particularly when you're filming, because you may or may not be aware that if you, um, well, firstly, to use this as a good example, the Mini 3 Pro doesn't have a variable aperture. So it's fixed at f 1.7, which is a very bright lens. It allows you to capture a lot of light um, but it does mean that in very bright, well, almost any outdoor conditions, to get a, a correctly exposed image, the shutter speed has to be really, really fast. So, you know, anything from two, three, four hundredths of a second. If it's really sunny, probably a thousandth, two thousandths of a second. And if you're filming video, um, you'll you'll notice that the video has this weird quality of being very juddery even though the, the gimbal is stabilized, and that's because there's no motion blur whatsoever. And so, yes, that's why you can buy neutral density filters that effectively, excuse me, are like sunglasses for the, the lens, uh, for the camera. It just reduces the amount of light that gets in, and so you can reduce the shutter speed down to a sensible uh, level, which the rule of thumb is a good shutter speed to aim for is twice the frame rate so if you're filming at 50 frames per second, uh, a shutter speed of, of one one hundredths of a second is will give you a nice amount of motion blur. So that was a very long answer to the question, do I use filters? <laughs> <laughs> and Headless come back and said, if you were to use goggles with the Mini 3 Pro, then technically you wouldn't have a line of sight control over it. And he also said, I keep a CPL filter on my Mini 3 Pro all the time. Am I being sensible? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I can see those questions come in. Thank you, um, Anne. Um, yes, so line of sight is an issue, obviously, with flying FPV with goggles. And so you do have to be accompanied by someone who keeps their eyes on the drone at all times in order to avoid uh, colliding with objects, hazards, aircraft. Um, so most of the times I've used the FPV drone so far has, has actually been indoors. And as soon as you go into a building, then all the CA regulations stop because regulations are only there to stop you flying into other manned aircraft. Um, but yes, if you're flying outside, you do need to have someone with you to make sure that the drone is not going to hit anything. So if you're immersed in the goals and you're focused on what you're flying around, but you can't see that there's a low-flying Chinook coming in at 100 feet, um, you might be able to hear it, but obviously you're you're so engrossed in the goggles and you can't take them off because then the drone will crash because you've got no idea where it is. So that's why you need an observer who keeps their eyes on the drone at all times. So for me, it's um, it's a bit, uh, well, I've not had that many chances to use it, but because I work on my own, um, the, the company is just me. It does mean I need to find someone or ask my client to be the observer if I need to fly outdoors with the FPV kit. Um, but so far, I've not actually had to do that. Um, uh, and your other question, having a circular polarizer filter on the Mini 3 Pro at all times, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, depends whether you're mainly doing photos or videos. Um, for photos, a polarizer is, is, is always nice because it, it will reduce the uh, reflections off of objects with or enhance their color. Um, yeah, the only time you may want to remove it is if you're photographing in very low light and because a, a polarizer does reduce the amount of light that gets through, um, if you remove it, you'll then be able to lower your ISO, the, the sensitivity to, to make the image a bit less noisy. That's the only time I would suggest removing it. Um, uh, Martin, do you have any problems when flying your drones of people complaining about the noise? Not, not really. Um, I do try, and it, it depends wh where where I'm flying and what I'm flying. The Inspire 2 makes a very loud noise, as you can imagine. Four kilograms of bulk has to make a lot of, has to push a lot of air around to make it fly, so it's very loud. Um, but the Mini 3, by comparison, and again, that's something that um, improves with each iteration of drone, is how quiet it is. And really, the Mini 3 in particular, once it's above 100 feet, you probably wouldn't notice that it was there, um, particularly when it's moving, um, moving slowly forwards. Um, it's actually louder in a hover than it is when, when, uh, when moving depending on the wind conditions. Uh, so no, I've not had that many issues. Um, the occasional issue I've had is if people are attracted to, to seeing that there's a drone nearby by its noise, and they're more concerned about what it's doing there rather than the noise it's making. Um, so privacy is a, uh, it's a, a very gray area. There are no real rules as to what, uh, what is an expected level of privacy to be uh, expected. Um, I just try and use common sense that if I'm photographing a, a housing development in a built up area for a construction company, if a drone was hovering over my garden, I'd probably want to know why it's there and who was flying it. And in that case, I would knock on their door first to say, just to let you know, I'm flying a drone here. I'm photographing this building site. Is that all right? And I don't think I've ever had someone say no. They, it, my my motto is it's always better to ask permission first than forgiveness afterwards. <laughs> that stood me in good stead. And so, yeah, just a question of using common sense, um, particularly because the sub 250 gram drones can be flown almost anywhere. It's makes it very convenient just to be able to pop it up from your back garden and buzz around the neighborhood um, because technically you are allowed to do that. 
but there comes a point where if you're flying it quite low invasion of privacy becomes a potential issue so it depends how well you know your neighbors and whether they know that you like flying your drone around that sort of thing um sean <clears throat> not a question some useful info And um, Alistair said, DGI's document documentation is pretty poor. Has anyone ever written a detailed manual for the Mavic 2 Pro or Mini 2? Just, um, okay. So I was just reading through Sean Goodhart's comment Sorry. about um, the what defines the risk of um, drones and uh, fatality. Yeah, that's a good... That's a really useful post. Thank you, Sean. I think the other thing that they measure it by is the amount of energy it can um, transfer in joules. So when it impacts you or impacts an object, the amount of energy that it puts into an object is based on its speed and its weight. And so I think that's another thing that have, has been used to settle on that 250 gram or 249 gram drone uh, weight limit is to limit that energy that it could potentially uh, impact, uh, push into an object. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know about um, manuals. I would probably suggest the best thing to do is to look on YouTube, actually. Um, there are so many people in the world that um, are, love putting stuff up on the internet. You're bound to find, uh, you know, uh, the the, the most detailed tutorial video you need ever need to use for the DJI Pro, uh, Mavic 2 Pro, or, or whatever platform you're flying. I'm sure that someone will have created uh, an instructional video on how to make the most of, of the drone platforms. And that's probably why they don't bother giving a very detailed instruction manual, because there's only so much you can convey in text and images in a, in a handbook really video uh, is, is is much more useful so definitely have a look on youtube i'd say and james um tends to agree with you on that he says he tends to use a lot of youtube video content for instructions some good video presentations there mm. that's fantastic thank you james and headley's come back and said i understand that the 48 oh yeah i can see that i can yeah. see that his comment there actually um so yeah you don't, don't worry about reading it out but thank you okay. <laughs> um yes yeah, so I could go into the, the 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 great details of it, but yes, basically, you do have four times as many pixels. Um, but it's and so yes, the the pixels are therefore four times smaller, which normally you'd think means they can capture less light, which means the images that you capture will have more noise in them. But that's where um, the clever clever post processing comes in. Um, so basically, whereas normally you, you'd have, uh, okay, you've got four times as many pixels for every normal pixel that you'd have in a normal camera. That means you can do clever things like, um, you can average out the noise between those four pixels. And so actually you might end up with an image that has less noise, bizarrely, because you've been able to do some, uh, noise reduction within each pixel if that makes sense um and so that's why suddenly in the last couple of years mobile phone cameras are going bonkers with the the, the megapixels so i think the latest one is 200 megapixels uh in in a mobile phone camera which just seems crazy but it's because um the hardware and the software have evolved and the computing power has evolved to such a point where you can do really clever stuff which um, doesn't throw traditional logic out of the window, but it means you can do clever things that you just couldn't do before. So, um, yeah, I've not really... If you shoot in, in on the Mavic 3, the Mini 3 Pro, in 12 megapixel mode, the images are less noisy than if you shoot in the 48 megapixel mode. Um, and I think most people probably will still use the 12 megapixel mode because that's when you benefit from all the the clever post-processing that goes on i personally use the 48 megapixel mode because you do get more detail than in the in the 12 megapixel mode um but the 
the raw files are painfully large. They're 100 megabytes each. But as I'm delivering images to a client, I want to give as much, uh, you know, the best image quality that I can. Um, but yeah, it's it's another really interesting evolution that's happening now in camera technology is, is what you can do in automatically on the sensor or in the processor before you even get to save the image to the memory card. Um, uh, so James, as you said, I've just started using a drone. I've gone to remote areas outside the village to practice. Uh, yeah, so um, in terms of where you can fly drones safely and legally, uh, it's a very good question. And there's a link to, well, it's basically caa.co.uk slash drones, and I'll mention that later. Um, it gives guidance on where you can and can't fly uh, safely. Basically, you just need to keep a, a certain distance away from people and other hazards. So, um, and again, these are regulations that have been shifting about recently, particularly depending on the weight of the drone you're flying. But generally, if you're 150 meters or more away from buildings or roads or people, then you'll be fine. Um, that the, the wording is a little bit um, grey in in areas. So, two fifty gram drones, you you can basically fly, you know, almost anywhere. Um, but yeah, I I would just recommend looking at the, um, the CA website for the for the latest definition on the on the rules because I I don't, wouldn't want you to say oh well David said this so I'm going to do it. Check <laughs> with the official regulations first. Um, because they are, as I say, they are in the process of changing at the moment. Um, yeah. That's fabulous. That looks like all our questions at the moment. So are you ready for a short break? I'm very ready for a break and a drink. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's like 10 or 15 minutes. Whatever you normally OK. Thank you. Um, I've just noticed when I go to share my screen, the option to optimize for video clips is grayed out um apparently that's i've just looked it up that's if the host um they have to only allow one person to share their screen rather than multiple so i don't know if that's something you can have a quick look at at your end yep i've done it i've changed it to one person ah okay let me try clicking try again. oh yep it is that's perfect thank you because um yeah i will be showing a few video clips later which um is never ideal over Zoom, but I think having that box ticked will be useful. <laughs> um, so where is my presentation file? There it is. Here we go. <clears throat> so back to the presentation. So I shall now, this the second half is, is basically a PowerPoint presentation, not death by PowerPoint. I, I hope it will. I hope it'll be interesting and engaging. And again, if you have any questions at any point, just shout. Um, so yeah, I'll go through a bit of, bit of my background, how I got to where I am today, and then talk a bit about the origin of drones and how they've evolved, as well as talking about the regulations. Um, so who am I? Well, you should know by now, my name's David Hogg. I'm the director of my own company, which I started, I registered in 2007 and uh, under the name Horizon Imaging. And I even created my own website way back then, um, very, very basic. And it was just somewhere that I put the aerial photos that I was starting to take um, as a bit of fun. I never really seriously considered that it would be my full-time business because that was far too scary uh, a thing to consider. Um, but I am based in Fleet in Hampshire, and I work across the south of the UK. Uh, I do travel further afield if need be. And I now offer a number of different services to my clients, including obviously drone photography and filming. I have some telescopic poles as well, um, which are useful in certain instances where drones can't, uh, can't be used, or I can't put a drone in, in an area where I can poke a pole. Um, I do architectural photography, so interiors and exteriors. I do Matterport virtual tours. I do video production and also time-lapse filming where I install cameras on construction sites uh, for the duration of projects. So I'm trying not to be a jack of all trades. Uh, I'm trying to be a master of all trades. 
but I, I'm specifically focused on property and construction because that's where I've I've decided, but also I've sort of sensed that's where the money is, um, at least for the type of photography that interests me. So once I'm in with a construction company, an architect, a property developer, they'll tend to keep using me. And so I've now been full-time nine years. And so the work from all the previous clients, as well as new clients that find me on Google, they sort of keeps me busy year round, which is great. Um, ah, I've got ahead of myself. So my background is uh, I've been flying model aircraft since I was 12 in 1998. Uh, and this is the sort of thing that I built just for the fun of it. Uh, this is a Balsa model aircraft uh, covered in solar film. And yeah, I just built it for buzzing around uh, local recreation ground, really. Um, but I was my attention was captured by forums on the internet where people were starting to attach cameras, digital cameras, to model aircraft. And this was back in... 2000 early 2000s I suppose and so I started attaching various very small most initially wireless video cameras so no recording ability um, but I would just be able to watch the video on the ground um, and that was really quite exciting because I'd never seen my local patch my recreation ground from the air before and so I ended up designing with someone's help and building a model aircraft that car carried a Casio 7 megapixel camera, EXZ750, if that um, rings any bells. Uh, it's a little tiny shirt pocket camera about that sort of size. Surprisingly good quality, actually, for its its age uh, or its, its era. That was 2006. And yeah, with this um, model aircraft, which was an electric powered glider, effectively, uh, I took this photo of Claremont Fancourt School in Isha in Surrey, and it just blew people away, uh, blew me away, actually. Um, that was one of about 500 photos I took on that flight, uh, and it was the only one that was composed properly <laughs> or framed properly, because although I did actually have a video link, it was a very cumbersome thing in a big flight case with a laptop and a video capture card. Uh, it's an aircraft, so it's constantly moving quite quickly. And so most of the, the pictures were either of the sky or of the ground or of not anything in particular. But on each pass, there's maybe one angle where the image looked nice. And that was that just set, you know, sparked something in me that thought, wow, you know, there's potential for this. So that was in 2006 uh, that, I, that I took that photo. Um, later in 2007, I sold the co uh, copies of the images to the school. And so that's why I now say I've been a commercial photographer since 2007, which is sort of true. Uh, and over the next couple of years, so 2006, I was in the middle of doing an electronic engineering degree at Surrey University. I was there from five to 2008. Uh, and I was just hooked on finding better ways of taking aerial photos. And so once I'd saved up enough money, uh, I bought a electric model helicopter and a underslung camera mount, which is what you can see there. And I also built the, the black box that you can see on the right. That's a, a sort of video downlink backpack. The white square thing is the antenna, which you pointed up at the, the helicopter. And that carried a something like a Canon PowerShot A620. 7 megapixel, didn't shoot in RAW, but was took good good quality 7 megapixel JPEG images. Um, and I did the odd commercial job with that um, on off, you know, after work or after the day at uni or on weekends. And yeah, just very, very slowly started building up a portfolio of aerial photographs. Um, I later modified that same helicopter um, by uh, fitting some modifications to it, making the undercarriage smaller, putting a ball around the camera, which made no difference whatsoever, but it did look make it look cool. Uh, and yeah, that was still with the same camera. I think I then upgraded to a PowerShot G9. Uh, then this was the biggest beast that I've ever built, um, a bigger electric model helicopter that carried a Canon EOS 550D, so an APS-C crop 
uh, camera body with a 10 to 22 millimeter lens and that probably still took the best aerial photos ever because um yeah it's just a, a big digital camera and uh, the images it took were lovely um unfortunately that crashed into a field and destroyed itself due to radio failure which was rather upsetting <laughs> but you know these things happen you move on and actually that was at the time where drones started becoming a thing and as i mentioned earlier they really started uh, and evolved from people tinkering in their garden sheds and so this was before the area of, of dji or it was just at about the same time and they used to people used to dismantle the nintendo wii controllers you know that the the games console where you can play tennis with your tv and you hold this thing which has sensors in it and so people would dismantle the the controller take the sensors out write some software to allow a microcontroller to to talk with the sensors and speed controllers and basically these things started to fly um so this was uh, a tricopter that i built uh, in 2011 and that was carrying a, a canon powershot s95 lovely little camera um 10 megapixel could shoot in raw i think um and yeah, so that was my first sort of foray into the world of drones, and it was wasn't bad. It wasn't stabilized in any means, so you really had to fly it the whole time. Uh, no GPS or stabilizing or anything. Still got it in a box. Uh, haven't flown it for about a decade, um, but you know that was the, the next stage in the the evolution. Um, the next thing that I built was this hexacopter. Hex meaning six uh, because I had six propellers. Uh, same concept, but carried a Sony Alpha A5100, so 24 megapixel uh, APC-S, yeah, crop um, camera body with a 10 to 18 millimeter lens. Okay, that probably took the best pictures of any platform I've, I've flown um, because it was, you know, that, that much more advanced than the, the Canon EOS that I had up there before. Um, and that really was where I launched out uh, doing full-time aerial photography work. And that was back in 2014. Um, haha, things really took off. Well, hey, it's the only bit of animation I'll be using today. Fear not. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of where, how I got into doing commercial work. And that's, uh, initially I just wanted to do drone work because back then drones were so unique that there weren't many people doing it. Um, the CAA introduced commercial licenses for doing any kind of commercial paid for drone work in 2010 and I got license number 46 in the country and there are now well over 10,000 licensed operators so I was really in there right at the beginning. Um, it's interesting that only about 3,000 of those are still active. So I think a lot of people thought they would try and run a business taking, you know, using drones, but they found it more difficult than they thought it would because a lot of licenses were issued, but a lot of them weren't renewed after the first year. So as I found, it's not just about having the kit. It's about running it as a business. And I had to learn all that from scratch. So uh, it's been a slow process, but nearly nine years later i'm still going and absolutely love it so that's me um oh yes i wanted to show you this uh i need to stop my screen share and share a new screen um this will give you just a little bit of background as to what i do and it has a lot of drone footage in it as well but it shows the other sorts of work that i get up to so you should be able to see that and you should be able to hear something when I press the play button.
So that's actually hmm, nearly three years old now. Um, actually, over a bit, bit over three years old. But it's a nice, <clears throat> gives you a nice idea of the flavour of work that I do and the sort of footage that I film with my drones. Um, so and it's also a shameless plug for my business, should any of you require my services. <laughs> uh, so let's go back to the presentation. Uh, so what is a drone? Where did it really all begin? Uh, well, if you look it up in the Oxford English Dictionary, it's to make a low, con a continuous low humming sound. Uh, and I hope you don't feel that's what you're listening to at the moment with me talking. Uh, hmm. Obviously, nowadays, it's a term used to describe any pilotless remotely controlled aircraft. Um, and initially, it was a word associated with military aircraft like the, the image you can see on the right there. And that got me wondering why the word drone? And I did a bit of research and opinion is probably still divided on, on how this came about, but the word drone actually is a type of bee. Uh, it's a male bee and its sole purpose in life is to mate with the queen and then it dies. So it doesn't do any of the work in the hive. Uh, it just sort of sits around and then it mates with the queen and, and dies, which is an interesting life prospect. And the parallel I and others have drawn is that drones are, well, in the early days, they were basically uh, uncontrolled, not remotely controlled, uncontrolled pilotless aircraft like this, which uh, is actually a basically a torpedo with an engine and wings. So, you know, the likes of the doodlebug and other um, flying bombs that uh, also only have one purpose. And once their purpose is fulfilled, they also die, they get destroyed. So that's my logic as to how the word drones became attached to these kind of unmanned aircraft. Um, but slowly, the, the word sort of stuck. And this graph, although it's a bit old now, um, shows the popularity or the frequency that the word drone was appearing in Google search results from 2005 to 15. And so you can see up until 2009, it really wasn't a very well, well used term uh, until you started getting military drones appearing in the news. So US drone attack kills four in Pakistan, or the second one I like, US asks Iran to return downed drone. I don't think they probably did. Uh, and actually, <laughs> the news headlines haven't really changed much because drones are still being used in uh, military conflicts and they're still being shot down and um, dismantled and people trying to figure out how the enemy's drones work and so on. Um, but really, the first time I think the word drone was attached to something with a civil application was when Amazon started murmuring about using drones to deliver parcels. And I think that was around 2014 or thereabouts. And so I think that was really where the drone, the word drone entered the public use for these kinds of things that you now see flying about um, from a civil point of view. They've sadly always been had a negative uh, image in the press, although to be fair, since I've been giving these talks, they are generally now in the in the news for more positive reasons. There was a, a, a period where, and it sort of, it took the regulations a while to catch up with the advent of drones. So there was a, a huge surge of the public buying drones and flying them where they shouldn't be and flying them over airports and closing airports. And they always seem to be in the news for, for bad reasons. Um, but actually there's been a shift in the last couple of years and they, now when drones are in the news, it's for really positive reasons. So it, it might be for, search and rescue or for drone shows, uh, replacing fireworks shows. So yeah, they, they are starting to get a better press. Um, obviously for the purpose of this talk, we're talking about models that have, or air, model aircraft effectively that have cameras or sensors on them of some sort. So what can they do? Well, I updated this slide this morning, uh, and there, I've just thought of something else that I could have added to it. So there's there's so many things that I could talk about here. And really, I'm hoping this talk will illumine, illuminate the, 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 the wide range of applications that drones uh, are used for that maybe you might not have thought of in the past. So 
obviously aerial photography is probably what most people think of when they think of drones. Uh, so that picture, by the way, was taken with that um, tricopter uh, that I showed you earlier, my homemade uh, drone, which, by the way, did fold up in the same way that uh, a Mavic 2 Pro or Mini 3 Pro folds up and goes in a box about that sort of size. So I basically beat DJI to the folding drone concept. Anyway, that's an aside. Uh, so, yeah, that's St. Martha's on the Hill Church near Guildford in Surrey. And that's predominantly together with aerial filming, that's really what I use drones for and inspections, which I'll mention in a minute. And they, they've they been around for a while, but they still, there's something, something indescribable and exciting about taking aerial photos of places that you, you either know really well or you've never been before and you want to capture really unique memories. And it's, uh, yeah, there's just something still magical that... Uh, gives me a thrill whenever I'm using drones, even though I've been doing it for so long now. Uh, filming is a, is a sort of separate industry in, in its own right. If you think of TV and film work, um, this was one of the earliest applications that I could find of drones being used for aerial filming. This is from a Harry Potter film where the, the car sort of loops and rolls around the, the viaduct as the train goes over it. And that sequence was actually filmed with a model helicopter. But because in those days, I think it was the early 2000s, digital um, film cameras, I don't think existed at that point. So I think it was it was a massive film, you know, cinema quality film camera that had to be carried up. So the model helicopter, as you can imagine, was massive. And I think it had um, maybe a two, two and a half meter rotor diameter and electric propulsion wasn't anywhere near good enough in those days to give any decent flight time. So I think it was powered by two miniature gas turbines. So it's like a basically a mini real helicopter that they used to to haul this camera up. But it you know it it captured people's imaginations because the I think the camera actually flew through the the archways of the, the viaduct, and it got people wondering how on earth was that shot. And in many ways. You know, the, the, the FPV drones that we I'm using these days are, are still making people think, well, how was that filmed? Um, so, yeah, and it's probably hard to watch any TV or film, a TV show or film these days without seeing some bit of footage that was shot with a drone, even if it's just some introductory shot where <clears throat> you start with the presenter talking and then you pull back and then you see where they're standing in, in the environment. It's just, it's become a... A really standard tool of the trade, really. Inspection. So technically, it's still aerial photography, but it's more specific, and it's something I've been doing for for many years as well. Um, the alternatives for assessing the the condition of buildings would be to use a cherry picker or scaffolding, which is both options are very expensive, very time consuming, and still very limited into in terms of where you can actually see, um, particularly with a cherry picker, you can only stand at the edge of a building and look into it, whereas a drone, you can use it to put a camera anywhere in the sky, basically, both indoors or outdoors. Um, I've inspected the insides of church roofs, um, the, the beams and things with a drone indoors uh, before. So uh, drones have revolutionized how, how aerial inspection work is done. And so I work with a number of surveyors now who just send me to a building. They're doing a condition report from ground level, uh, from the outside and inside, but they need to be able to get really detailed photos of the roof or areas that they wouldn't be able to, to see from ground level. And yeah, it's just there's no other app, um, bit of technology that does it as good as a drone, basically. And there's a, there's a whole... It's a whole industry, um, aerial inspection, and there are very specialised drones that have been developed, some of which are basically in uh, drones that are encircled in a spherical cage. And they actually you can, means you can fly them down pipes, you can fly them inside gas storage tanks. And if you bump, bump into the walls, it doesn't matter, it keeps flying. And it'll, it'll often have lights attached to the drone, so it can fly in, in pitch black environments and... Yeah, it's same same principle, but tailored for a very specific application. Um, 
what other sort of inspection so um they're used for inspecting the the condition of pylons electricity transmission pylons um wind turbines uh, gas flare stacks on oil rigs and particularly sending cameras into areas that are too risky for people um that's really where the, this type of drone technology has excelled um and there are so many different applications that I, that I could show you but i just don't have the time uh mapping it's a really interesting one and again this is something that's only come about because of the evolution of both the hardware so that the image sensors and software for processing the images that you've taken so this uh image on the right i think is some kind of open cast quarry perhaps might not be actually looking closely at it but if you imagine drones can be pre-programmed to fly automatic routes now because they have gps position hold capability they know where they are in space and you can program them to fly a sort of zigzag waypoint mission across a an area taking pictures every couple of seconds and so you can very quickly build up a, a library of thousands of images of of an area of land the clever thing is then the special software that will look at all these images just normal you know two-dimensional photographs and they'll be able to overlap them stitch them together but also e extract somehow three-dimensional depth information so you can actually build a three-dimensional model and that's what you're looking at here the colors representing the different heights of the terrain and so as soon as you can do that that opens up a huge huge range of applications of mapping things from the air um so in the example of an open cast quarry you can imagine if you fly over the quarry calculate the the volume of the area that's there and then you do it again a few weeks later after the material has been removed you can see you can calculate how much of the material has been removed because you can see that the the landscape has changed um and depending on what equipment you're using you can get down to a resolution of you know, a centimeter or or less um so it's yeah it's being used for all sorts of things from um yeah stock levels on and quarries to mapping river basins and floodplains to see which areas are most uh, at risk of rising river levels uh and i did dabble with creating these sorts of three-dimensional models i went on a course learned how to do it but it didn't really give me the fizz if you know what i mean um but more sort of marketing related photography still gives me so i decided not to pursue that but it's a whole industry in its own right so if i get inquiries for people that want to create a three-dimensional model of a building for uh, you know refurbishment purposes then i just recommend someone else um surveillance slightly contentious topic perhaps uh with all the talk of invasion of privacy and gdpr and all these things however they it still serves a really really useful um application that's a really old picture by the way uh, i haven't seen that <laughs> that drone being used for decades now um but yeah there's just the ability to put a camera in the sky very quickly has been has really helped uh, particularly the emergency services um i meant to put surveillance and search and rescue kind of lumped them together because they're, they're, they're very similar so certainly with the evolution of small thermal imaging cameras that detect body heat being able to have that in a very quick to deploy drone in the back of a police car if someone is lost um uh, you know out in very hostile terrain it's so quick now to send a drone up you get a uh, live video feed as you're flying around you can pick out body heat and there's been there have been numerous stories of people who have been found really quickly compared to searching with people on the ground you know with dogs or flashlights or, or whatever um so that's just a, a huge potential positive application if used correctly i'm not suggesting anyone that has a drone should start surveilling their their local area and <laughs> you know seeing who's um lying out in their back gardens that's uh that's not good that's an invasion of privacy but surveillance used in the right terms is a, is a fantastic application 
Uh, delivery, I did mention it earlier with uh, Amazon, and I've sort of often joked about this, but really um, it's taken the regulations a long time to get their heads around how to make this safe. And it's still not, you're still not going to have your Amazon Prime delivery delivered by drone just yet. But there are certain areas of the of the world and certain use cases where drones are now being used really successfully. Um, I think they've been trialing using fixed wing drones to carry cargo to remote islands in the UK, I believe. I think it was the Orkney Islands, perhaps. Um, or they have done some trials with literally like you see here, uh, a multi-rotor drone delivering cargo or packages to very remote locations. Uh, what really excites me is the sort of more emergency use cases. So this is an image of a project many years old now, um, which proposed dropping a, or well, not dropping, carefully delivering a defibrillator to uh, an emergency, the site of an emergency. And so if you imagine in a very built up area, a drone can get anywhere really quickly, particularly modern drones that are able to avoid buildings, obviously. Um, and so the concept here is that it would deliver a defibrillator to, to a person in an emergency, and it would also deliver a video tablet, <clears throat> which would connect you via a video call to a paramedic, and then they could guide you through the process of how to use the defibrillator. So if, as soon as you think of these kinds of applications or um, you know, dropping life rings to people um, having problems out at sea, it's suddenly the ability to carry something that will help save someone's life and delivering it to them very quickly without any need for road transport or any normal means of transport, I think is very exciting. Um, another application is delivering medical aid, again, in very, very harsh environments where there are maybe no roads or really bad roads that would take you weeks to drive along um, because drones can be automated and flown remotely. They don't even need to be within radio range of the controller in, in the normal sense. They can be controlled by a satellite now, so they can be flown from the other side of the world. It's just so exciting. Um, but ultimately, they are just drones. They're the same concept and design that I've been talking about today, just being sort of fine-tuned and, and honed for very specific applications. So these are a couple of new images that I added earlier today. Uh, precision agriculture. So again, using a drone to deliver something very specifically uh, to allow farmers to um, apply fertilizer or pesticides to very specific areas of, of their crops. So drones are, are being used uh, in the same way I mentioned earlier with mapping. There are sensors that can detect the, the condition of crops just based on the type of um, radiation they emit. It's not visible light, it's I think, oh, it's either infrared or ultraviolet or a mixture of the two. Uh, it's called hyperspectral imaging. And it allows farmers to see areas of the crops that are most at risk or that need most attention or have disease that needs to be kept under control. And so that data was gathered using drones. And then you can use automated drone crop sprayers just to apply the fertilizer or pesticide or whatever it is to the areas that need it. You're not covering the entire field with these chemicals when only a little bit of it is actually needed. So this ability to again, to deliver something to a very specific area uh, is, is now being picked up very quickly in the in, in agriculture. And DJI actually make um, drones like this, um, but I think there are, there are restrictions on which countries they can be used in, so I'm not sure they're actually being used in the UK yet um, for, some, for some reason. This is an interesting one. Um, tethered solutions. So there is... Obviously, there are limitations as to how long you can fly a battery-powered drone for because the battery has a finite capacity. However, there is uh, there's no reason why you can't have a very long, very fine, high-voltage wire going from a, a ground station, which is connected to the mains or a massive battery or a generator, 
up to a drone and effectively giving it almost unlimited flight time. Obviously, you need some kind of careful mechanism that handles the, the wire because wires and propellers, not a good combination. Uh, but I think as the drone flies up, it sort of unreels the uh, the wire from, from the base station and then probably the, the ground station winds the wire in and so effectively pulls the drone back out of the sky so it's not going to get caught up. But, you know, as soon as you have that ability to power something in almost indefinitely, the, you know, you, so many applications open themselves up. So that in this case, um, the ability to have hovering temporary lighting, uh, I think they've been actually used recently in, in Turkey in the earthquakes there. I've seen videos of a drone hovering and, and using a very, very powerful light uh, that, you know, you can pop up and it'll just sit there until you know the petrol runs out in the generator or whatever's powering it um but equally you can have a, a surveillance camera put up there so i think those are used at uh, sports matches to put cameras uh temporarily up uh in locations but for prolonged periods of time so for a football match you'd need it up for several hours and no drone hovering drone has that kind of um battery capacity but because you're only needing to go up and sit in a particular location, a tethered solution uh, is a fantastic way of doing that. Uh, <clears throat> ah, yes, personal transport. Who would have thought of it? Uh, so, you know, I've talked about the scalability of drones. Um, this is just taking that to the next extreme level. And, you know, it sort of almost feels like science fiction, but there are so many companies seriously investing a lot of money in developing personalized transport um, with you know basically what are basically large large electric powered drones and they're, they're they're meant to be the next big thing in urban transportation in busy cities to, you know from, to hop from skyscraper to skyscraper or um, I mean they, they have a fairly decent range of you know, 50 or 60 miles I think so who knows um, so far, the ones I've seen are all very small, carry one or two people, but there are larger ones that are designed to be like aerial taxis that can carry several people. And yeah, it's just all evolved from the same basic concept. I mean, that's effectively a, an octocopter. It's got eight propellers, electric powered um, on fixed arms, uh, much like a drone that I, I'd be flying. So um, very exciting. Ah, yes. Who can forget the uh, the aerial corgi, uh, the uh, the Jubilee celebrations? Um, drone light shows, again, something that's just come out of nowhere in the last couple of years uh, to the point where I had to add this slide in because it didn't exist a few years ago. Um, and so for those of you who aren't familiar, these are all all the points of light you can see in the sky are drones with multi or with light with lights and can change color. And so they're all controlled from the ground and they use both GPS and some kind of have some kind of knowledge of where they are in relation to one another so they don't crash into each other. And <clears throat> they can just form these incredible shapes uh, in, in the sky. And they can, because the lights can change color, you can create all sorts of scenes. You know, your imagination is really the only limit. Um, so, yeah. And I could probably make several more slides of the different applications of drones, um, but then my talk would be far too long. <clears throat> Hang on a sec. <laughs> so very briefly, I was going to talk about the state of the art. I've already sort of gone into this in the other parts of my talk, um, but really multi-rotors is where, where it is, uh, whatever shape or size this, uh, they take. And it's simply because they're mechanically very simple so the, the model helicopters that you saw me uh, showing earlier that I designed and built from scratch, they were very mechanically complex. They had lots of linkages that all had to be perfectly aligned and, and tuned regularly. Otherwise, you get lots of vibration. Whereas these multi-rotors, they, they literally have as many moving parts as there are propellers. So if you've got eight rotors, you've got eight moving parts. Uh, and so there's really very, very little to go wrong with them. Uh, if you need more redundancy, you just 
basically add more propellers. Uh, although, in general, it, they've been a lot more reliable than people have expected. So uh, if you have four propellers on a drone, if one of them fails, it's probably going to fall out of the sky. So that's why often if you're carrying really expensive cameras uh, for TV and film work, you really need six or eight just in case uh, you have a failure. Um, but even then, you know, DJI continue launching products like the Inspire 2 or the forthcoming Inspire 3 that just have four propellers. So that, I think, shows that they're very confident in the in the uh, reliability of the platforms because they are so mechanically simple. As I've mentioned and hopefully demonstrated, that it's a very, very scalable concept and they are also very easy to automate so they can be programmed to fly all sorts of interesting waypoint missions uh, with with great ease. Uh, something I've also mentioned is the these three axis stabilized gimbals. Um, and really, as I, as I mentioned earlier, that is one of the things that made a big difference in how yeah, how drones have have taken off, if you pardon the pun, because there's no good having a fantastic drone if the footage it generates is is really wobbly and, and unusable. So these uh, three axis gimbals again evolved on forums on the internet. So on the hexacopter that I showed you earlier that I built, um, that actually had a two axis gimbal, so only roll and tilt, which I built myself using. Um, the, the motors and bearings and a uh, little control board that I bought off the internet and then I built the frame around it. Um, but it's the, it's really the likes of DJI and there are other companies that specialize in creating these three axis um, brushless gimbals that create absolutely rock solid footage, no matter what you're doing with the, the, the thing it's attached to. Um, and again, they're mechanically very simple, so there's very little to go wrong with them. And they can also be either flown on a drone or carried. And again, that's that's been an interesting sort of spin-off from these uh, gimbals being used on drones is people started attaching handles to them. And that's then gone on to revolutionize stabilized filming in the cinema and TV world, um, because previously something like the steady cam which you might have heard of or seen, requires a very, very big, heavy, sprung-loaded vest that you then hang the camera off, which still has its applications because you don't actually need to hold it. Uh, and so it's it's quite a useful um, system for prolonged filming, but it's still very cumbersome and big and heavy. Um, so these three-axis stabilised um, brush, they're called brushless because that's the type of motor they used, um gimbals have really opened up all sorts of opportunities for filming in in close quarters in in tight environments and i mean dji have their own wide range of uh stabilized gimbals like this i've got one of theirs which is incredibly uh, it's invaluable for ground level filming because you can just walk around with this thing and it absorbs all the the vibration and the wobbling that you get if you're hand carrying the the camera and they have their own range of gimbals for holding mobile phones as well, because mobile phones uh, are, have become very capable with uh, the video quality they can film. And so they've released little stabilized holders that you clamp your phone into, and then that allows you to take really smooth footage uh, yourself with, with just a mobile phone. So yeah, it's, it's been interesting how this has all evolved from the evolution of drones. Uh, <clears throat> so the interesting things about can anyone buy them and the regulations? So yes, absolutely, anyone can. Um, there's nothing to stop anyone buying their own drone. No one, you don't need any prior experience. Um, but I always mention that uh, because back when I started building and designing and building drones, they they were effectively model helicopters or model aircraft. And the, the typical route that people would go down is you would join a local model flying club and you'd get some, you know, an expert, a seasoned model aircraft pilot to show you the ropes, to show you how to fly safely. You'd learn how to maintain the drones. You'd learn about the no-fly zones, um, where you can and can't fly and so on. 
and that was great and the, the, the model aircraft community remains um a very very safe industry uh because of you've got this this community of flying clubs where you learn how to to, to do it to fly to maintain and to operate safely but because drones are now so readily available this whole step has been skipped out and so it sort of wasn't surprising really that drones were being flown by people in areas where they really shouldn't have flown them um to be fair it's now the, the regulations have caught up a little bit and i think manufacturers a lot of the onus has been put on them to provide instructions uh, or at least links to the local regulations of for the countries that you you fly in um and even the you know when you buy a dji drone they have their own kind of online training course that will actually pop up on the on the flight controller i don't know if you can see my my image of me at the moment um but you know you you'll get uh, quizzes that pop up and and test you on on basic knowledge about where you can and can't fly drones obviously it's different in every country but broadly speaking you know don't fly drones where they, they'll pose a risk to to people uh, or people in cars or people in manned aircraft and that sort of thing so yeah I think we're in a better position now than we were four or five years ago when you know the people were buying drones and flying them without really thinking about the risks because although they're small they do they can pose a risk to the to the safety of people and particularly flying them close to things like airports uh, which is really not a good idea and obviously is illegal um if you are interested in in learning more um the bmfa the british model flying association are a fantastic organization to join and they provide insurance cover for uh, the, the the personal the, the hobbyist drone pilot and they've got lots of information and they they are the ones that run the, the model flying clubs around the uk so definitely have a look at uh, the bmfa for one thing and the other thing is the caa's regulations so there's a link uh, in the next slide i think uh about the regulations so they've evolved over the years uh this, the uk civil aviation authority have developed their own list of rules and then they've also been sort of combined with the the european aviation safety agency rules uh even though we're now no longer in the eu the the regulations are so that they were all brought up to much the same level just before the uk left unfortunately when we left that no that means that you if you have a uk approved license or you've got the right permissions in place to fly a drone in the uk you can't just go abroad and fly abroad you now need to sit a, an equivalent test in any of the member eu countries and then you can fly your drone in any of the eu countries it's a bit of a faff now to be honest but uh, it is still possible so uh if like if i'm going to austria later this year if i want to fly the drone there i need to have passed an online test with uh it can be a, um, a company that provides the tests and it can be based anywhere in the eu uh, and then it's valid for you to fly in any of the EU countries uh in the uk though the regulations are now starting to diverge a little from the the eu regulations so they they're going down a slightly different route and really where we are at the moment is that it the regulations depend greatly on the weight of the drone and where you're flying it that's really the the, the two defining factors um the best place to look is the CAA website. So make a note of this address. Uh, it's quite quite a simple address, caa.co.uk slash drones. And that has so much information on it. Um, basically, you need to have um, these two things called a flyer ID and an operator ID uh, before you can before anyone can fly a drone. Um, the flyer ID is the person who actually flies the drone. The operator ID is usually the same person, but if, in the case of parents and children, if they're below a certain age, then I think the parent can be the operator. 
and they have to have the operator ID. So they are aware of the rules of the of the air where you can and can't fly. But the child, I think, has to have their own flyer ID. Best to check on the CA website for the for the details. But really, the the rules still are pretty common sense. So keeping the drone within your line of sight, so don't fly it behind objects because obviously you can't see what it's about to fly into. There are uh, strict distance limits as to how high you can fly a drone, and that does depend on um, how close you are to, to airports, uh, which I'll mention in a minute. Uh, so 120 meters is a very standard maximum altitude, and there used to be a maximum limit of 500 meters. I don't know if there's a slide for that. No. Um, you used to be able to fly up to 500 meters away, but now they're really they've put the onus on the pilot that the maximum horizontal distance you can fly is determined by a number of factors but basically you have to be able to see and maintain orientation of the drone at all times so yeah you basically need to be able to see it in the sky and be able to tell which way it's pointing what it's close to basically to avoid collisions with things um so obviously buildings, trees, but more importantly, manned aircraft and yeah, anything else that might be in, in the sky. Um, so people used to fly out to 500 metres because that was the limit, <clears throat> myself included. Uh, and at that distance, you imagine something the size of the Mini 3 Pro that I showed you, it's going to be a tiny speck. And chances are, if you glance down at the video feed and then look back up, you might not be able to, f to find it again. So now I mean, it's, they've always called it visual line of sight uh, and that's not really changed. So they've just really reinforced the need to follow that strictly. And again, it always boils down to the pilot as being the one in, in control. And they they're the ones that have to prove, should the worst happen, that they were operating safely. Uh, there are some restrictions of how close you can fly to residential areas, but those are then uh, affected by the weight of the drone. So if it's below 250 grams, this doesn't apply. It's best to become familiar with all the, the, the ins and outs of the regulations on, on that website there. Um, especially if you live or are wanting to fly near airports because they have their own special restrictions. Uh, it doesn't mean you can't fly close to an airport, but if you're within this this zone, you need written permission from the airport, uh, which is doable, and I do it quite often. Um, but it's, you know, you have to follow a process to do that. Uh, in terms of commercial use, I'm conscious of time. Ah, it's 12.29. Uh, originally, you need a, a very specific license to be able to fly a drone, regardless of its weight. Um, now, if a drone is below 250 grams, you only need the flyer and operator IDs. Uh, as soon as it's over 250 grams, I think, or maybe it's 500 grams, it's, it's changed recently. You need to sit the next level of uh, online test, and the tests get progressively more difficult as the weight goes up, because if you're flying something like the Inspire 2, which is quite lethal if that was to hit you, not, not necessarily fall on you, if it just hit you, um, it would do a lot of damage. So, yeah, as the risk, as the weight and risk goes up, the, the um, now it's called an operational authorization that you need to get from the CAA, gets very involved and you need to write a, a detailed manual about how you operate safely and mitigate risk, et cetera, et cetera. So it can get very involved. Hence why I like using sub 250 gram drones wherever possible, because it makes things so much simpler uh, from my from the pilot's point of view. Um, I'm conscious of time. Uh, are we OK? Do you normally want to finish at uh, half past? Um, yes, we normally aim to, but um, keep going. I'm sure everybody's loving it. <laughs> OK. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, you've seen some of the aerial photos uh, that I've shown already. I was quite keen to show you um, some of the FPV work that I've done uh, rather than the photos. So um, these are quite short, a minute or two each. So uh, let's start with this one. 
Uh, so this was filmed with the little FPV drone that I showed you. And apart from this, these two first clips, so from now on, what you're watching is a single recorded clip. Okay, technically it's two clips because the battery ran out halfway through. Uh, but, you know, the, the next couple of minutes, this is all one single flown um, flight. So I was sitting um, at the far end of the site wearing the goggles, and this is basically what I was seeing uh, whilst I was flying. So your your view of the surroundings is is becomes sort of two dimensional because you don't have that sense of depth or perspective, but um, it's it's still more than enough information for you to work out how to fly and avoid objects safely. Um, and what I love is like this shot here, flying through, flying underneath the tigers. <laughs> uh, it's just a shot that you could not get any other way. Um, and particularly this ability to, you can see the shadow of the little drone there, uh, this ability to do one long continuous uh, shot is really quite appealing. And it's not easy. It's really not easy at all. Um, DJI have come out with their own FPV drone called the Avata. Uh, as, also, as well as a, a larger one that, that is just called the DJI FPV drone. Um, but, but it's not to be tried without being very careful. <laughs> um, I'm sure DJI are rubbing their hands with the amount of broken FPV drones that they get sent back to them for repair, because it's very easy to crash these things, um, particularly uh, because a lot of them don't have... Well, they, they do have collision avoidance sensors, but things can happen very quickly. So that's where the, the clip changes. So this is now the second clip. Uh, it's very <laughs> it's very easy to for things to get out of hand um, whilst you're flying in this very unfamiliar um, way. But it is hugely rewarding. And so I'm now trying to build up a portfolio of this type of footage that... Uh, I can I can then offer to to other clients because it it, it serves quite a unique purpose. Um, you couldn't get this footage with an, with flying a drone normally, but equally um, this type of FPV drone isn't very good for sort of high level slow panning shots because it's um, at least this drone isn't stabilized with GPS. So they're just different tools for for different jobs. Um, so yeah that. Everything you've watched just now was was two clips, um, which is uh, <laughs> it's a lot of fun. So then this clip was taken with a Mini Three Pro. Um, so this kind of footage is really suited. Um, you can't do with the FPV drone; it's just not designed for this kind of super stable filming. Um, and then I'll show you one more. Uh, which one should I show you? How about this one? because I'm conscious of time. So this was filmed inside an office. Uh, well, it was it's a converted 13th century barn, uh, which has been converted into an office space. So again, I was sat at one end of the, the building and all these people were aware of the drone and what it was doing, um, but they wanted to show off this, you know, this new facility in a very dynamic and easy to um understand way so i had a lot of fun flying around this this building flying through the rafters uh whilst wearing the these goggles and yes yeah, it's, it's it's great fun um difficulties trying to start offering a new type of filming service if people aren't aware of what is possible uh so it's you know a question of maybe sometimes doing it for free or giving a discount um but I'm slowly getting traction uh, because people, whenever they see what I've filmed, they absolutely love it. Um, okay, I'll show you one more very quickly. Uh, this is very recent, actually. This was last week. Um, this was a manufacturing facility, and this will be the the main video on their uh, homepage, showing you know a very quick tour around their facilities. So I got someone to stand at the door there to open the the blind or the door as it as uh, they saw the drone flying in. 
And again, I was sat uh, directly behind this drone right in the far corner uh, where I hopefully wouldn't get caught on the video. And I always test to make sure that there's enough uh, video signal at the furthest extent of the flight path to make sure that it won't lose signal. And then because I'm not, I'm not seeing it, uh, then it would get a bit awkward because <laughs> uh, it would just crash. Um, but yeah, this this was a lot of fun. Um, and with my background in engineering, this was a very interesting environment to fly around with all these automated machines. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, so fly back around and back out of the entrance. Um, I think we should have run out of time, unfortunately, um, but that was basically the end of the, the presentation. Uh, so happy to take any last questions if there are any there aren't any in the chat um but maybe we just need to call it need to wrap up because of the time but yeah i hope this talk has given you a, a real flavor of what drones can be used for and that they have so many applications that many people might not normally think of um just have a quick look james said wow those last clips had me holding my breath i think he speaks for us all <laughs> <laughs> I, I was holding my breath as well almost in some points um i've just seen a couple of couple of last questions yeah which i'll cover very quickly a recommendation of a couple of good youtube videos unfortunately i don't really know what to recommend on youtube the best thing is just to try searching for uh mavic 2 pro tutorial videos and you'll you'll come across loads um Yes, there are apps to, um, that can recommend where you can um, find somewhere to fly safely. I can't think of the names of them off by hand. They are probably recommended on the CAA website that I mentioned earlier. Um, Altitude Angel, I think, is one of them, also known as Drone Assist. Might be worth looking up. Um, yeah, do you use a smart controller? Uh, yes, so I use this. This is the, uh, let me stop screen share. Uh, this is the smart controller, which has a screen built in, but also some of the other drones, I also connect my phone on top. Don't really have a preference. This is the fewer things you have to remember to have charged, um, but the battery on this runs out more quickly because um, it's it's doing more. Is that, is that true? Yeah, the, sometimes a mobile phone screen can be better than the quality of a built-in screen. That's that's the only thing to think about. Um, have, have I used ever, a three sixty? Sorry. Have you ever used a three sixty camera on your drone? Oh yeah, uh, I haven't, but I have seen many people that do, and that is another amazing uh, application because uh, websites like YouTube allow you to move around 360 degree um video so yeah you can um and actually there are specific 360 cameras that can be mounted to a drone where you have a camera looking up and then one looking down and basically the drone disappears so you can just look around in 360 degrees and not see any drone at all which is amazing uh flying above the sea nothing really to be aware of just um if you're flying from a boat just remember that most drones will set will have a, a limit as to how far you can fly from the takeoff position so if you take off on a moving boat the drone is still measuring the distance from where you took off even if you're flying alongside a boat um it's the takeoff point is still where you originally took off from so just be aware with, with that i think that's it i think that's it so I know I speak for everyone here um, this morning when I say thank you, David, for this brilliant talk. It has been absolutely fascinating to learn more about drones. And thank you for demystifying the seemingly endless red tape around them. Your passion really comes through. And it's clear hearing you talk with such openness and authority why you're the number one aerial photography company in the UK. Oh, so thank wow. you so much and if anybody else would like to express their thanks to David please put your comments in the chat box and I will forward these to him afterwards but thank you so much for your time today I have thoroughly enjoyed it and I'm sure everybody else has if we were all in the room together you'd get a great round of applause um, <laughs> but with everybody on mute um, that's not possible but 
thoughts. Thank you so much. Oh, you're, you're very welcome. I, yeah, I could talk for hours on this subject and I always have to rein myself in because I go off on tangents. Um, but <laughs> yeah, it's been a pleasure. And if anyone's got any questions, um, please do share my email address with them. I'd be happy to help. Lovely. Thank you so much. Thank okay. you, everybody. And um, hopefully we'll see you in four weeks time. Um, it's We've got the Prenton Jones talking about composite work um, then. They're absolutely fabulous couple. They will have you laughing a lot and learning a huge amount. So if you haven't already booked your tickets, make sure you get online and do that. And thank you again, David, and see you all soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>